Listen up, everybody. It's time. Please welcome. Introducing. Making sense. Are you ready for it? Of a changing world. Okay, I need to start this episode with a confession. Um, the first six or so minutes of the last episode, I wasn't being entirely honest. Okay, I wasn't being honest at all. I was lying. Um, I know. I get it. and I understand. I understand your frustration. But let me try to explain. It, it, it wasn't my idea anyway, and I think it makes a valuable point. So let, let me try to explain. Okay, well, thank you for the opportunity to explain myself. I, I hope I can make it up to you all. Uh, let's take a closer look at that article I mentioned at the beginning of last episode, Body Ritual Among the Nasarima by Horace Minor, which apparently is about a cultural group located somewhere between Canada, Mexico, and the Caribbean, uh, which sounds like the United States. So I wonder why Horace Minor did not just say the United States, because where else would this be? And as you see here, I summarized uh, some aspects of their culture as described by the anthropologist Horace Minor. Um, these include uh, traditions of theirs which say they came from the East and that their nation was founded by a great man named, uh, it probably sounds something like Notnisa, uh with a silent uh, H. Um, Horace Minor said their whole culture is founded on the belief that their bodies are ugly and prone to disease and they spend a lot of time and resources on trying to make themselves attractive and healthy or that is what they consider attractive and healthy according to their emic perspective and one of the points i made in introducing this is that uh cultural groups that may seem very different may actually not be that different after all so why don't we try to view the nasarima through this lens um, and we can do so maybe maybe by filling in the blanks on this chart. So let's think about things in that article that sound uh, very different, um, things that might even sound exotic, even though we don't use that term in anthropology, as, as I said. Um, and let's try to think of more familiar things that these seemingly strange things might compare to. So we'll start with the shrine, uh, that place where they apparently keep all kinds of powders and potions to make themselves healthy and attractive. Um, maybe that sounds a little bit like a bathroom, or maybe more specifically the medicine cabinet of a bathroom. So let's just put in a medicine cabinet for now. Next one, medicine man. This one might be a bit more obvious. So in their culture, a medicine man is a specialist who uh, takes care of people's health. I guess not unlike a medical doctor in uh, you know Western society. Um, how about the holy mouth man? Another specialist, uh, this one takes care of their mouths, tells them how to take care of their mouths, and uh, guilts them if they do a bad job of it. And that guilt is very powerful because, remember in this culture, people are obsessed with the health and the appearance of their mouths. So it sounds to me like maybe the holy mouth man is something similar to what we might call a dentist, just, just perhaps. Then there's the part about baking heads, which sounds bizarre and potentially even harmful, but maybe not so much if you compare it to, I don't know, a hair dryer, especially those like cone-shaped ones in, in salons. Um, next point, maybe less strangely, the role of the listener in this culture sounds perhaps a little bit like uh, the role of a psychotherapist. So those were all details of the cultural group itself, and then I gave you one point that came directly from the anthropologist and his evaluation of their culture, and that anthropologist, Horace Minor, called the Nasarima a, uh, quote, magic-ridden people. Well, is that really fair? Um, it sounds like magic does play an important role in their culture, but to call them magic-ridden implies that magic is in everything they do, everything they think about, and that magic kind of structures the whole lives and how they make decisions. Um, okay, so we'll move on to the final couple of points. There is also this origin story they share 
uh, which tells them that they came from the east. And remember, this group is located in North America, so maybe this might bring to mind the old colonial view that there was nothing really going on in North America until it was discovered by Europeans, who of course came from the east of North America. Uh, they believe that their nation was founded by a great man named Notnisa, as I said, which is an incredible coincidence because um, you know, the, the first president of the United States, his name was Washington, as you, as you probably know, and just by some amazing coincidence, if you spell Notnisa backwards, you get Washington. It's, it's really incredible. And now what makes this coincidence even more incredible, this is astounding, is that the name of the people, Nasarima, if you spell that backwards, guess what? You get American. <laughs> because the Nasarima is not a real article. This is satire. The Nasarima are just Americans. <laughs> And what makes this even more hilarious is that if you spell Latipso backwards, the health shrine, you almost get hospital. <laughs> okay, so that's, uh, that's more than enough of that. Um, yeah, to make this abundantly clear, the first six or so minutes of episode three are uh, completely false. None of that was real. I was lying. It was based on a, a piece of satire. Um, I know, I know, I know. I know, but I promise that's the only time I will ever lie in this video series. Everything else from here, right up until the last episode, will be 100% the truth. Um, and like I said, the whole thing wasn't my idea anyway. I didn't come up with this. Uh, all that bullshit was based on the article Body Ritual Among the Nasarima by Horace Minor, which was published way back in 1956 in American Anthropologist which to this day is one of the most respected journals in the field. Um, so like I said, the jokes are over. The rest of this is all the real story and, and the reality. Um, academic journals, as you know, are usually not funny at all. Um, not even a little bit, let alone hilarious like the Nasarima article is. Normally there are no jokes. Um, I don't know, maybe hilarious is going a bit far. I think it's pretty funny. I also think it's quite ahead of its time. Um, I don't think many others were doing that kind of trolling kind of satire in the 50s um it's almost like something uh like sasha baron cohen would do but this this was done over 60 years ago so please don't be embarrassed if you fell for it and if you thought the nasarima were a real cultural group um first year instructors have been assigning that article ever since it was first published and uh, many students have been falling for it the whole time so when i teach intro to anthropology in person Usually, I don't know, between a half and maybe two-thirds of the class believes it to at least some extent for at least some amount of time. Um, and a few people who, you know, skip class or don't pay attention keep on believing it's real right up until the final exam. So um, let's now ruin the joke by explaining it in great detail, right? I'm going to tell you why I included it in this series and why this fake article about the Nasarima is important in the history of anthropology. Um Main, the main takeaway is it's like this snapshot of an important moment in the history of anthropology when the discipline really started to, to finally break away from ethnocentrism. Now, ethnocentrism basically means assuming that one's own culture is the normal one or often the best one and that all other cultures, by comparison, are, I don't know, weird or maybe cute or maybe even inferior. Um... And that often comes out in the, uh, in the vocabulary that we use to talk about ourselves and others if we're thinking ethnocentrically. For example, uh, the Nasarima article talks a lot about rituals. Well, it's in the title, Body Ritual Among the Nasarima, right? Uh, a ritual is really just any set of tasks that people repeat to bring about a certain result. And you can find rituals of various types anywhere in any aspect of life in any culture. But the idea of a ritual, I think it often brings to mind something that's irrational, uh, that involves people putting total faith in, in like a supernatural power maybe, or I think the concept of ritual usually brings to mind something strange or uh, you know, so-called exotic. So from an ethnocentric perspective, um, let's take a common ritual for many of us, like brushing your teeth and flossing, which is something is seen as something normal that you do twice a day or, you know, pretend to do twice a day when you talk to your dentist. Um, 
but you know, a, a healthcare practice from a different cultural context might be described as a ritual, even though on um, in, in, in practice it's it, it kind of works the same way. Um, or if we take an example from the NASA Rima article, arguably in the United States um, and in Canada, you know, as well by extension, I guess people place a lot of faith in experts and institutions that they don't really fully understand. Um, and they trust that if they obey those experts and institutions, then things will work out. Um, perhaps even almost like magic. Well, an ethnocentric perspective on that might say that, well, that, that's a magic ridden people. These people believing in experts and authorities and institutions, they don't fully understand. So on that note, body ritual among the Nasarima often gets discussed as a satire of American culture at the time in the 1950s. And I think to a large extent it was. Uh, by using this kind of exoticizing language to describe things like doctors and hospitals and toothbrushes, uh, Horace Minor was making fun of American consumerism and beauty standards of the mid-20th century and maybe also how misinformed many people were about health. So to take one of the examples that we highlighted uh, a couple of minutes ago, the, the so-called La Tipso hospital spelled backwards, uh, I guess it is kind of weird in actual hospitals that patients have to wear those gowns. I mean, I, I get that you can't have people in street clothes and, and maintain you know, a sterile environment, but still, those, gr those gowns are arguably kind of degrading, maybe. So arguably trading in your street clothes for that hospital gown, that's part of the ritual that, um, that becoming a patient in a hospital involves. But in cases like that, when writing about moments like that in cultures, the author has a choice to make. Do you write about that seemingly strange or different thing using vocabulary that plays up its strangeness? Um, that's what was often done in earlier anthropology. And the point that, Harris the, the point that Horace Minor was making is that if you make something sound strange, sure enough, it will seem strange to the reader. Um, and to me, the real value of this article in an anthropology course is not so much its satire of American culture, but more its satire of anthropology at the time. So like I said, this was written in the 1950s. By then, anthropologists weren't talking about savage and civilized people. They weren't ranking different so-called races, and cultural relativism by this time was the new norm. Uh, but there was still a lot of baggage left behind from those old days. Anthropology was still seen as the study of small-scale and remote societies. Uh, it was still using this kind of exoticizing vocabulary to describe those societies. So the way that Horace Minor describes Americans, the so-called Nasarima, in that satirical article is very similar to the ways that real articles described actual indigenous groups at the time, um, playing up difference, using exoticizing language, um, making them sound strange or even quaint or maybe something like cute sometimes, which is incredibly obnoxious and, and, and patronizing, of course. Um, anyway, the critique that Horace Minor was making was... An important part of the next major shift in anthropology, which was this shift away from othering. Um, and I also think that his article was kind of hilarious, even though I've now ruined the joke by explaining it for, uh, I guess, about 10 minutes or so. Okay, enough about the Nasarima, but just to repeat one last time, it's not real, it's satire. Um, the first six minutes of episode three were also satire, but everything else in this video series is completely real and honest and legit. I will never lie to you or troll you again. So let's get back to some real anthropology. Let's start back with the emic and the etic, this pair of concepts I introduced last episode. Uh, like I said, they came out of linguistics in the 1950s. We use them in sociocultural anthropology as well. Uh, in short, the emic is the insider perspective and the etic is the outsider perspective. So the insiders are the people being studied and the outsider is the anthropologist doing the research. So the emic is the worldview we're studying. Uh, the etic is the anthropologist's interpretation, which is shaped by his or her own worldview. Um, anthropology involves interpreting the emic on its own terms, and then seeing how it relates to the etic and what that can tell us about ourselves. 
Um, so one familiar example I gave in the, the last episode, the word religion, that, that's an etic concept. It's like a general category for belief systems. We talk about this in a lot more detail next episode, but the point is we can look at many different belief systems around the world and categorize some of them as religions. But for the people who believe in those specific religions, um, that's, that's reality. That's the emic. Um, a couple more keywords uh, I'll go through to, to get started as well. Um, first one is worldview. Uh, we think about worldview as a culturally specific understanding of how the world works and of one's place in the world. Worldviews are formed through interpretation, and interpretation is the process of creating meaning out of experience. Uh, we've covered this a lot already, but here it is again, cultural relativism, uh, the idea that there's no use judging other cultures by one's own cultural standards. Instead, we should strive to understand them on their own terms. Ethnocentrism is judging other cultures or practices by one's own standards, um, assuming one's own worldview or culture is the norm or that it should be. And I think for our purposes in this series, you can say that ethnocentrism is pretty much the opposite of cultural relativism. Uh, Eurocentrism is one kind of ethnocentrism in which a Western European worldview is the one that's taken as the norm. But there are other kinds of ethnocentrism, and it's possible for anyone anywhere in the world to hold ethnocentric views, to assume that their cultural context is normal or better. But the important question that then comes up, which we'll talk more about um, in a couple of episodes, is you know who has the power to make their ethnocentrism normal or influential, and why, and where does that power come from? So like I said, we'll return to that throughout the series. So let's pick up the story of the history of anthropology with the work of one of Franz Boas' students, Margaret Mead, who is without a doubt the most famous anthropologist of all time. And last episode, I provided a link. I recommended watching a documentary about one of the biggest controversies in the history of anthropology, the controversy over Margaret Mead's work in Samoa. So I'm not going to describe the whole documentary to you, but I'll give you a brief plot summary. So as you'll know if you watched it, as a young graduate student in the 1920s, Margaret Mead went to American Samoa to study the experiences of adolescent girls there. And the point was to see if adolescence is a biological reality or is it a cultural construction. So think of what being a teenager is like in North America. Uh, for most people, it kind of sucks. Uh, it's awkward. It's confusing. You have skin problems. You don't have much personal freedom. Uh, well, what's the problem there? Is the problem biology or is it culture? Uh, Boaz and Mead figured that you could answer that question by studying adolescents in two very different places, two, two, two very culturally different places. And if life for teenagers is more or less the same in both places, then biology must be the reason that being a teenager is, is so awful for most people. But if adolescence is different in these two places, then clearly it's culture that de determines what being a teenager is like. So the idea was Samoa is a very different place from the continental United States, so this would be the test case in figuring this out. Uh, Samoa is a complicated place, and full disclosure, I don't study it, so I can't really do it justice, but I'll just explain some basic facts just to help set the context. Samoa is a group of islands in the South Pacific. It's roughly halfway between Hawaii and New Zealand, um, at various points, these islands were colonized by England, by Germany, by New Zealand, and now some of the islands form an independent nation state, aka country, uh, which is called Samoa. And the other islands are a so-called unincorporated territory of the United States, which is called American Samoa. So Mead went to American Samoa. So Margaret Mead and her supervisor Franz Boas assumed that being a teenager in American Samoa was probably very different from being a teenager in the United States because it was so culturally different. And so Margaret Mead went to Samoa to, to find out, to, to try to prove this by doing fieldwork. So after nine months of fieldwork, she came back to the United States and she said that no, adolescence is not this universally horrible thing. Um, in Samoa, it's actually quite pleasant because Samoa is such a laid-back society. It's, uh, in her words, a place of free love and harmony. Um, the main point of her ethnography was to prove that things that look biological 
are usually cultural constructions instead. Um, people liked this story, and it made her famous. So that film that I provided the link to, that film even says that she was one of the three best-known women of the 20th century. But then 20 years later, um, another young graduate student went to Samoa and found the exact opposite of what Margaret Mead had found. So Derek Freeman, this, this other anthropologist, did field work in the same place in the 1940s and again in the 1960s and said that Samoa was actually a very conservative, often violent society where sexuality was very tightly controlled and repressed and young women and teenage girls had very little personal freedom at all. So Freeman published his findings in 1983, uh, which was five years after Margaret Mead had died, and anthropologists have been arguing about it ever since. So that film is from 1988, and to this day, it's shown in full in many Intro to Anthropology courses. Uh, when I teach Intro to Anthropology in person, I usually show the whole thing in class, and it often leads to some pretty interesting discussions and, and debates. There's lots to say about it. Um, and again, I'm not going to summarize the whole thing, but I will say that it's certainly not a perfect film in and of itself. The, the, the controversy is confusing enough. And the film itself is, um, I don't think it was, it did, you know, a completely thorough job. Uh, it skews very hard to Derek Freeman's side. So I want to add a couple of points to kind of round things out. Um, and then I'll give you a bit of a summary of what's happened in the debate since that film came out, you know, 32 years ago now. So of all the anthropologists who, are, who appear, who are interviewed in that film, um, I think Laura Nader was the most fair to Margaret Mead. And she does so by being the most harsh to Derek Freeman. So one thing that Mead is often accused of by her critics was speaking to a very narrow segment of Samoans and then painting a very narrow and indeed naive picture of Samoa based on that limited data. So what I mean specifically, this came up over and over again in the film. She was a young woman who spoke to teenage girls. Um, now I think it's a valid critique, but the problem is Derek Freeman kind of did the same thing. Um, he was a man, and he spoke to powerful men, and then generalized about all of Samoan society based on what those powerful conservative men had said. Um, so don't take my word for it. Let's look at a selection of textbooks. Let's see what the experts say. Um, I just want to give you a sample of, of how this controversy has been presented to students in recent years by the authors of some, uh, some widely cited textbooks. So we're going to start with this one. Um, this one is Cultural Anthropology by uh, Kenneth Guest. And uh, this is Kenneth Guest's take on what happened. He says, Mead mobilized her fieldwork findings to engage in crucial scholarly and public debates at home in the United States um, at a time when many in the United States argued that gender roles were biologically determined. Mead's fieldwork testified to the fact that U.S. cultural norms were not found cross-culturally, but were culturally specific. So um, in this one, the author basically talks about the, the significance of her findings in terms of broader debate in American society at the time, the, the, the nature versus nurture debate, um, and mentions that Mead's work was a powerful contribution to the, uh, the nurturer side and uh, does not mention Derek Freeman's uh, critiques at all. So that was one example. Uh, next example of how a recent textbook deals with this controversy. This one is Cultural Anthropology by uh, Schultz, Lavenda, and Dodds, and... I've highlighted a part I wanted to read from this. Here we go. The 1960s and 70s marked a turning point in anthropological concepts of fieldwork. Many assumptions about the way the world works were called into question, um, as was the, the nature of scientific inquiry. New Zealand anthropologist Derek Freeman's critique of Margaret Mead's early fieldwork in Samoa illustrates the tone of the debate. Um... Well, that's playing it pretty safe. <laughs> there was this debate around whether fieldwork is like an exact positivist science, which I'll, I'll say some more about a bit later, um, or is it a process of interpretation? And the fieldwork kind of mentioned, or the, the textbook rather, just kind of mentions that both of these people were quite influential in that debate. Okay, um, let's look at this one. Stories of Culture and Place by, uh, by Kenny and Smilly. And their take on the Mead Freeman controversy goes like this. They write, In the realm of academia, uh, fellow anthropologist Derek Freeman launched an attack on Mead's work after her death in 1978, asserting that Mead's conclusions on female adolescent sexuality were all wrong and that her informants had essentially duped her. Uh, Freeman's criticism of Mead's work 
however, has been, has been widely critiqued within academia and provides an interesting snapshot of how two people can observe and interpret the lives of others in vastly different ways. Um, so otherwise a great textbook, but um, very much a cop-out answer, I feel. <laughs> Again, it's like there was a, a controversy, and this illustrates um, the fact that controversies sometimes happen and people have different interpretations. Um, anyway, let's look at this. This is the one that I think has the most uh, useful commentary on the situation. This is Sociocultural Anthropology, um, <clears throat> excuse me, by Robbins, Cummings, and McGarry. <clears throat> and they make a couple of points that I wanted to highlight. Um, throughout the book, Mead painted a picture of Samoan society as peaceful, and she noted that the girls were free to experiment with premarital sex. This acceptance contrasted sharply <clears throat> with American attitudes at the time regarding sexuality, where premarital sex was viewed as taboo. Her ethnography, which was widely read by anthropologists, students, and the mainstream public, cultivated, perhaps unintentionally, a romanticized and exotic representation of Samoans for a largely Western audience. Later generations of Samoans critiqued her work, often denying that teenagers engaged in gratuitous sex. Uh, some anthropologists are quick to point out that the missionization of, Samo of Samoans has contributed to the development of stricter moral ideals of sexuality, ideals that in turn have affected their perceptions of Mead's texts. Um, even so, their objections raise some interesting questions for anthropology students. What if the anthropologist's interpretation of culture um, differ from those of his or her informants? And what are the consequences of the representations cultivated by the anthropologists? So that's a good summary, I think, of the questions that, um, the most useful questions, I think, that come out of this debate around, you know, who was right or can anybody actually be right, etc. Um, so what I'll do next, I'm going to add uh, some updates on some of the more recent debates, but I'll mention first that... Um, the last textbook said that some anthropologists are quick to point out that a lot of the debate misses the, the point of cultural change over time. And I'll add that um, I'm one of those anthropologists. I think it's silly to even say that Mead and Freeman studied the same place because the research they did, I mean, yes, it was in the same place, but it took place decades apart. And a lot can change over decades, whether we're talking about Samoa or the USA or, or Canada for that matter. So like I said, the debate continues, and I want to show you some more examples of how somewhat recent anthropologists have interpreted this. Uh, you have some people voicing very strong opinions on one side or the other, and a lot in the middle. Like I said, most textbooks tend to you know play it down the middle or play both sides. Um, at one extreme, though, there's a recent uh, academic volume that says that Derek Freeman um, made most of this up because he had a mental illness, and as part of that, he uh, made things up and was fixated on debunking Margaret Mead. Um, the most recent book published on the controversy is from 2009, and it's called The Trashing of Margaret Mead. And this author argues that Freeman manipulated and distorted his informant's uh, testimony, and that Freeman exploited the political context of the time, of the 1980s, to stir up controversy for personal gain. So in the United States in the 1980s, the, the so-called religious right was very influential, um, and right meaning the political right, the right wing. So these were, for those who don't remember the 80s, these were politicians and media figures who blended a right wing political agenda with Christian fundamentalism. So as part of that, uh, the religious right was viciously homophobic. They wanted to enforce Christian prayer in public schools. Um, many of them thought that all women should be home, be homemakers because that's, that's natural, they thought. Uh, so the point is that Margaret Mead became famous for arguing that gender is determined much more by culture than by nature, and also by documenting sexual freedom. Uh, many powerful people in the 1980s did not want to hear either of those things. It was not in keeping with their politics. And uh, this one author anyway basically says that Derek Freeman was telling those people what they wanted to hear about nature and nurture. So if anybody cares what I think about this, hopefully someone does, well, I consider myself an historical particularist. So I want to emphasize the point that I made um, a couple of minutes ago. The documentary does mention this, but I feel they don't give this enough uh, screen time, I guess. The fact that 
um, so much time had passed between Meade's and Freeman's field work. So Freeman's first field work was done 20 years after Meade's, and then he did some more field work another 20 years after that. So in this total of 40 years, there had been a great deal of Christian missionary activity in Samoa. So there was this huge, heavily funded effort to change how people think, to get them to accept, among other things, traditional Western gender roles and monogamy. Um, so I don't think Freeman adequately accounted for that. I also suspect that he didn't think carefully enough about the difference between what people say and what people really do, because those are often two different things. Um, that same critique was made of Meade, and it was probably you know, relevant to what she did as well. Uh, but Freeman certainly seems to have been, um, you know, vulnerable to that too. But he somehow gets off the hook for this one in that documentary, I think. Um, all right, my other, my main problem with the documentary was how it presents that interview with the uh, the very senior Samoan woman uh, near the end. That interview is presented as like the, the kind of smoking gun. Like this will resolve once and for all what really happened. And the woman goes on to say on camera that she and her friends had indeed lied to Margaret Mead when they were young. So, you know, she looks into the camera and says that maybe that is the case. I, I'm not, you know, I have no reason not to believe her so that, that she could have been being honest in that moment by admitting to have been lying to Margaret Mead many, many years before that. That could be it. Or it also could be, I suspect, maybe this very senior woman in a society that had been influenced by a very conservative interpretation of Christianity for decades Maybe she wouldn't feel like admitting on camera that in her youth, uh, her and her friends had perhaps had a lot of casual sex. So if this was a real anthropology classroom, there would now be, you know, probably a 45 minute, maybe a one hour debate on uh, the Margaret Mead, Derek Freeman situation and the subsequent perspectives and arguments on it. We can't do that, of course. It's a YouTube channel, so I think we've spent about enough time for one channel on Margaret Mead and Derek Freeman for now. Um, let's move on to some other anthropology from this era and a little bit afterwards. Um, and let's continue with this question of whether there is one truth out there that an anthropologist can capture or whether a story can have more than one true meaning. And one uh, classic case study in this is Shakespeare in the Bush by Laura Bohannon, first published in 1966. So, in short, this is an article that resulted from an anthropologist trying to explain the plot of Shakespeare's Hamlet to a group of people with a very different worldview from hers. Um, the author, Laura Bohannon, was an American anthropologist who was in Nigeria in the early 60s doing research with the TIV, who at the time were a group of subsistence farmers. Um, she wasn't there to study what the TIV thought of Shakespeare's Hamlet, though. This, this article came about basically as, a, as part of a happy accident. Um, the topic just came up kind of randomly, spontaneously, and she ended up writing a pretty interesting article about it. So at the time, the TIV were mostly non-literate. So Bohannon tried explaining Shakespeare's Hamlet to them verbally. Um, their interpretation of what was happening in the story of Hamlet is quite different from how some of us perhaps were taught to interpret Hamlet in, um, in, a, in a Canadian high school or, or university setting. Uh, most Western scholars would say that Hamlet is a morality tale. It's about indecision and it's about the problems with seeking revenge. Um, and as Bohannon said herself, she wrote that she was, uh, quote, quite sure that Hamlet had only one possible interpretation and that one is universally obvious. Um, that's not the case, and she found that when she tried to explain the story to the people she was doing research with, a, a group of non-literate subsistence farmers in Nigeria. So what do they think the story means? Um, that would be the emic in this case, and uh, you know, in the end, what's the point of this discussion anyway? So I'll try to answer those two things kind of all at once. Um, let's look at a couple of quotes from the article. This one came after Laura Bohannon had finished explaining the story of Hamlet to the Tiv, um, and some things they told her back, some of their feedback on her storytelling included um, uh, whenever she asked them a question, their reply would be, well, that's the way it's done, so that's how we, that's how we do it. Um, some other feedback they gave her, they said, this was a very good story, and you told it with very few mistakes. 
Some more feedback for Laura Bohannon from the TIV. They told her, sometime you must tell us more stories of your country. We who are the elders will instruct you in their true meaning so that when you return to your own land, your elders will see that you have not been sitting in the bush, but among those who knew things who have taught you wisdom. So the point is, Laura Bohannon is an American anthropologist. Uh, the TIV are very different from Americans in many ways. And their interpretation of Hamlet was very different from Laura Bohannon's. But what is similar here? Uh, the similarity, most anthropologists will tell you, is that everyone is constantly kind of making their own emic. Everyone is interpreting information based on their own cultural context. And people tend to think, most people like to think that their view, their way of doing it is right, or at least normal. Um, because your own cultural context is, is like the air you breathe. You don't even know that that's what you're doing, interpreting things through your cultural context. And when pressed to think about it, of course, it's appealing to imagine that yours is the normal one or the right one. Um, but the next question is, you know, whose interpretation of Hamlet based on their own cultural context, which one of those gets, gets to be the common one? And why is that? Um, we'll answer that question or try to anyway throughout pretty much the rest of all the episodes. So questions like these led anthropologists to begin questioning the positivist orientation of the discipline. Uh, what I mean is, by the mid-20th century, by the time of this article uh, and most of what we've talked about today, uh, cultural evolutionism and scientific racism were pretty much out. But it was still largely taken for granted that anthropology was a science that produced objective truths about people and places, and those people and places were still, for the most part, small-scale societies, indigenous groups. Um, so a next major innovation came with the work of Clifford Geertz, um, most notably his study of, of cockfighting, when people pit two roosters against each other to, to fight to the death and, and then bet on the fights. Cockfighting, um, Geertz studied... Uh, the kind of social scene around this practice in a particular part of Indonesia in 1973. Um, and Geertz is often credited with the innovation of what's called thick description, uh, looking deeper than the surface level of what's happening to understand what things really mean in their local cultural context. And this is just to get started. I'll say a lot more about this next episode. Um, but Geertz's view, which became very influential, was that studying culture, in his words, is not an experimental science in search of law, but an interpretive one in search of meaning. So I'll say some more about that, as I said, in the next episode. Um, but for now... Uh, by the, you know, into, into the, to the late 20th century, we have this split emerging between um, an inductive approach, which focuses on what the people themselves have to say about their lives, and a comparative approach in which the anthropologist begins with universal ideas like, like religion or superstition, for example, and compares how they play out in different societies. So since then, anthropology has gone off in many different directions, but I think what still holds most of it together is the goal of understanding the things people do and the things they believe in light of the idea of culture. But at the same time, there's been some major debates and divisions uh, among anthropologists in more recent decades on how best to do this. So one major split followed the publication of uh, the book Writing Culture by Marcus and Fisher from 1986. And essentially what they did was take Geertz's idea of interpretation to a new level and say that, you know, all we can really do is, is interpret things. Um, we can't really know anything because it's impossible to be objective and any conversation between anthropologist and research participant is going to be shaped by who these two people are, where these two people came from, and how they happen to relate to each other. Um, and then on top of all that, through globalization, we have culture moving all over the world and blending with other cultures, so there's no one truth to uncover about any of them anymore anyway. Uh, that Everybody's just sort of part of this global exchange. Those ideas became very influential through the 80s and 90s, especially among anthropologists who take an interest in uh, postmodernist and post-structuralist literary theory. And as a result, um, well, in my opinion, a lot of the anthropology of those days became a little bit unreadable unless you also happen to be well-versed in postmodernist and post-structuralist literary theory. Um, 
I'm, I'm betraying a bit of my own personal bias here, but any, anyway, some of the work in this vein reads um, almost like poetry, and the focus almost becomes autobiographical. It's more about the anthropo anthropologist's experiences in the field than it is about the field itself. And so in these arguments, uh, this approach was often kind of pitted against a materialist approach, which was based on a blend of, of the methods and approaches of mid-20th century anthropology with some Marxist theory, which we'll talk about more in two or three episodes from now. Um, anthropology in this vein continued to study uh, how people make a living, how that's affected by the politics and the economics of their communities, and how all of this shows up in their cultural practices. Um, most anthropologists in this vein would also say that objectivity is really impossible, but for different reasons than the, the postmodernists say so. Um, and most would also maintain that even if it is true um, that objectivity is impossible, it's still possible to do field work and write something valid about the field itself and not just write like a first person account of what it was like to be there in, in one moment. The next big divide was around the question of, um, well, what's the point? Why are we doing this? And uh, on that note, many anthropologists argued about what we should do, if anything, about social injustice. And the reality is we see a lot of it. Because like I said, anthropology used to specialize in the study of small-scale indigenous societies, and partly as a result of that history, that baggage, um, most of us still study poor and marginalized people. And so some anthropologists, uh, most famously I think Nancy Shepard Hughes, have said that we're ethically obligated to do something to help or to, or to resist. Um, and she based this argument on her many years of field work in northeastern Brazil, where many of the people she spoke to and lived with um, and developed these long-term tight connections with were so poor they couldn't afford to keep all their babies alive. Um, Nancy Shepard Hughes found that uh, people would avoid forming an emotional bond with some infants, knowing that they'd probably have to let them go at some point. And that's where the title of the book, Death Without Weeping, comes from. So Nancy Shepard Hughes' argument was, in a situation that terrible, anthropologists have to act. They have to do something. And she has an article from this era where she outlines what she calls a militant anthropology that basically says knowledge for the sake of knowledge is useless and anthropologists should be using their knowledge to fight for social change. Um, a lot of people were inspired by this and I think many more were outraged or worried by it and the debates that came out of this, uh, they continue. Um, so this brings us, this is the end of the history of anthropology for now. Um, it takes us almost into the present and like I said, that debate around, you know, political involvement continues. So do all the other debates that I've talked about in this episode and, and last. Um, arguments and debates like whether we should write culture like a novel or whether there is a truth out there that we can dig up and document. Um, like I said, the question of whether we should be politically active in the field or if our job is to be, you know, more like neutral observers or like, you know, documentarians maybe. Um, debates around what globalization really is and how we should study it. And to go back to episode three, what to do with the old research and the old literature that we now know is full of problems. So is there anything salvageable from the work of the cultural evolutionists, for example? Um, anthropologists like Tyler and Morgan who had very racist worldviews. Um, were there other insights in that old literature that can be pulled out of those books despite their other problems? Um, can, can, you, can you do that? And, you know, speaking of, of salvageable and salvaging, what about salvage anthropology, right? The things that ended up in museums after having been gathered by the salvage anthropologists what to do with those things? Well, these are all very complicated questions. No easy answers to any of them, which I think is what makes them so interesting. And we'll return to them all throughout the coming episodes. Um, the rest of the series is about what anthropologists actually do. And we'll look at some of my favorite case studies of anthropological research now that we've covered this, uh, this somewhat long and, and maybe at times dry history. But I think it'll get more interesting from, from here on in. Uh, thank you for, for listening and watching. All right, what do I have to lose? Let's go.
know, it could have been a lot worse. Um, I'll take it. That marker me.